Here's our function. Quick note, they've written it as log with no base. I don't like writing, when I have a choice, I don't like writing log with no base because my brain sort of fizzles out and gets confused. So I will either write base E or I will write LN. Um, I think in most cases I'll write LN because I'm lazy. But um, in this case, and you'll see why in a second, I've actually written base E because I want to highlight the fact that there's a base there and I'm going to do something with it in a second. Question A says write down the domain. Now, just before we get like fully like stuck into tangled up in the question, I want you to note that what we are doing now draws together a lot of threads from the rest of the course, right? Um, it's why in your HSC exam, a full 20% of it will be prelim content, stuff from last year, because in maths, you cannot escape the things that you learnt two or three or 10 years ago. It's all one big coherent whole, okay? So to find the domain of this, maybe the first thing you thought was, I don't remember how to find domain, okay? With domain for certain functions, it's really easy. For instance, if I gave you this, we instinctively know the shape of that because we've been dealing with it for a couple of years now. So you're like, oh, I know. You can have the left part, you can have the right part. It's just the bit right in the middle that's no good, right? So I know the domain of this. Logs though, less common, okay? Maybe it helps you to remember what a normal log function looks like. It looks like this. So that picture is hopefully in your brain. So you can see that this implies a domain, right? Namely, x is greater than, greater than, what's, what's this boundary here? It's just greater than zero, okay? Now, we have something a little more complicated than that, okay? So to help you like work out what's going on, x is greater than zero because what does a log mean? Um, people in my class know I really like this metaphor, but maybe others haven't heard of it before. I like to think of logs as trying to work out how long does something take to grow. So see this thing here, right? This statement is parallel to this statement, yeah? So imagine I have a machine that doubles things every minute, okay? Every minute you put something in the machine, it's obviously a very large machine, uh, it doubles in size. So if you were there for five minutes, right, if you left that object in there, then what you would end with is something 32 times the size of what you started with, yeah? So what does this mean? It's asking the same question from the other perspective. If I put you in the doubling machine and I want you to end up this big, 32 times bigger, right? I want you to be giant man or whatever he's called. It's gonna take me five minutes, okay? Five minutes. Now what does this mean, okay? Well this is saying, how long does E, we know what that is, 2.71, etc. How long does that take to grow into whatever these numbers are going to be? Now it's a variable, okay? But the key that I'm trying to get at here, which makes sense of this, is that if you are growing, you can go forwards in time, you'll get bigger. You can go backwards in time, you'll get smaller. But at no point will this thing ever be negative in size. Does that make sense? You make it bigger and bigger, it can go huge. You can make it smaller and smaller, it'll get tiny, 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 but it will never get negative. It's like, ooh, I possess zero, negative volume, okay? Doesn't make sense. So that's why x is greater than zero. This thing here has to be greater than zero. Does that make sense? So my question then becomes, okay, well, when does one plus x squared, when is that greater than <laughs> zero? Hmm. This is for domain, I should have said, okay? Well, I know what this thing looks like. Like, I'll just draw a quick and dirty graph over here. x squared is just the regular parabola. What difference does the one plus make? It shifts it vertically, up one unit, right? So this is one plus x squared. So it's not a trick question. When is that thing, that parabola, when is it above zero? And the answer is, it is always above zero. There is no part of this parabola that, that floats beneath the axis. So therefore, when is this true? And the answer is, any real values of x. It can exist anywhere. You can put any values of x in there and it's happy. That's a bit weird because we're used to logs having a domain restriction. But this guy does not, okay? So there is part A, done. Part B I'm just gonna artfully skip because the results that you require are there. I will write them though. So I've got my first derivative in which we use our, um, we use the log differentiation rule that we've just developed. Then when you go to the second derivative, you're differentiating this. So you no longer have a log to deal with. You unfortunately cannot avoid quotient rule here. So that's why you end up with this result. So I'll just jot that down like so. It's squared, isn't it? Happy times, okay? So you got those. I don't think you will have had too much trouble with them. 
Part C then says, hence show that. Okay, so it says hence. What does that mean again? I must use the previous part, sometimes multiple parts. Okay, show that it's got one stationary point and determine its nature. Which part of the working that I have right now is to do with stationary points? It's the, it's the first derivative, this guy. Yeah. So I'm going to use that to find where the stationary point is. And then being that I've already got this, the second derivative, I might as well use that to determine the nature. Does that make sense? OK. So how do I do this? Well, how do you find a stationary point? What do you do with this thing? Very good. So um, stationary points occur. Remember, if your stationary point, sorry, if your first derivative is 0, you're guaranteed of a stationary point. Points of inflection, they're where you like. Maybe, maybe not. Stationary points definitely occur when your first derivative is 0. Okay? Now, that's the first derivative. You guys can probably see it's quite easy to deal with. Have you found the stationary point? Where is it? It's, it's at the origin, right? So dot, dot, dot. You're going to have to go through some working there to show what the value is, to show what the y value is. You get a stationary point at 0, 0. What kind of stationary point is it? It's a local minimum. How can you tell? Yeah, when you put 0 into here, when you put x equals 0, I should say, you get 2 times 1 on, what do you get on the denominator? What's this become? It's just 1. So you just get 2. That means it's concave up. That's a minimum. Okay. So I'm just because that's not the focus of what we're working at right now, I'm just going to write that. And I think you guys were OK with that. All right. So a picture is gradually forming in your mind. You've got all real values of x. This guy can go anywhere. You've got a stationary point, which is a local minimum, down here at the origin. What's next? What do they request after this?